Oh, awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining uh, today's special uh, Big Data Platform Geospatial Data Community of Practice webinar, uh, co-organized with uh, ICAS, uh, enabling crop analytics at scale initiative. Uh, so today we have presenters from uh, ICRISAT and University of Twente ITC, and also with IPRI and, and AWARE uh, for last two years, uh, we have been working on this new innovative crop analytics project um, yeah, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gage Foundation. And we were able to wrap up the project end of last year. So we are glad to present our, um, our output today. Uh, and everything is still on pilot stage, but there are still very innovative and exciting uh, outputs that we think will be also useful for your crop analytics work uh, on the ground. So we wanted to go ahead and start sharing today. Um, so I will briefly give some background. Um, uh, yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, I'll <laughs> briefly give some background now, and then I will hand it over to uh, University of Twente team for the first work package, uh, work stream, and also Srikan and others that equip that for the second work package. Okay. Um, so the, our title of the program or project was Crop Production Analytics Using Dynamic Area Sampling Frames in, and uh, Smartphone 3D Imaging. And uh, just, just a quick background on why we are doing this. Uh, timely information on crop type, growth, and productivity, uh, we collectively call them uh, crop analytics, uh, can provide critical insight for food security decision makers. Yet crop analytics is also highly challenging to generate at scale. We saw a lot of pilots out there, but uh, it, it's been uh, challenging to apply in different geography, different crops, and different um, you know, scale of areas. There are many satellite remote sensing based analytics being developed, uh, but their application in practice can be constrained by the availability of quality ground truth data. On the ground, on the other hand, uh, collecting ground truthing data at scale is logistically challenging and expensive, and the data quality is not always reliable. So it's, not, uh, it's easy to be also biased, especially in small scale producers farming systems. So that's why back in 2019, uh, we had the idea that this problem really needs to be addressed at both scales um, uh, side by side. So with the support of Tetra Tech's ECAS initiative, uh, we developed a pilot in Odisha, India uh, in collaboration with uh, our ECRISAT colleagues. Our first work stream uh, integrated, uh, investigated how we can improve sampling frame such that we can improve the representativeness of field data over space and time uh, using satellite remote sensing data. And also uh, we have planned to uh, further improve it with high resolution weather data. In the second work stream, we piloted a new computer vision application uh, to rapidly collect crop yield data using smartphone camera. So you can learn more about our work uh, at cropanalytics.net website. Uh, again, like we've uh, successfully wrap up this project, uh, pilot project last year, uh, and there are three part reports already available for you to review, uh, download, and learn more about it. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to University of Twente team, uh, Andy Nelson case to take it from here. Thanks, Jabu. I hope you can hear us all clearly. Uh, sorry for joining a little late. We had a technical problem. Let me start sharing my screen and then we can begin. And I will hand over to Case to talk you through the, um, this part of the seminar. So hopefully that's working and you can now see our, uh, our screen. Yes, we can see. Case, over yes. to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yavu, for the introduction. Um, let me start with the opening slide and refresh what the study is about for me, at least this part. The study aimed at creating a blended earth observation-based field-based method to improve the quality of crop production estimation, where the critical step is the question how to extrapolate point data from the field on yields to area statistics on production. Normally, sampling follows an area frame approach whereby block, what you see here on the left side, a few, ag few agri-based villages are selected where crop cut experiments are carried out. 
Obtained yield data are assumed representative for all villages of the whole block. And with the use of cropped area statistics by village, block specific crop production data are estimated and published. This method does not consider internal ecological and crop production differences within blocks and two requires, it requires an enormous effort and expense to assess by crop and season crop production estimates of Odisha. To create a blended earth observation based and field based method, an EO based method, uh, it requires two sequential study objectives. Uh, the first one is to actually prepare a benchmark map of strata, which have minimum variability within and maximum variability between the strata that relates and that actually reports on land use systems present in those strata. And the second step is for each and every strata and season to create a DAF, which is a um, uh, basically uh, an assessment of the variability within strata to relate to measured yield data. I will show you more of that later in this presentation. First, I would like to address why we chose NDVI as the indicator both to map and to assess performance. NDVI is basically influenced by many aspects and especially climate, weather, uh, extreme events, uh, vegetation type density structure, pest diseases, soil aspects, crop type, variety, health aspects, crop stage, crop calendar, water aspects, soil management aspects. So in all, it is a response indicator that accumulates all uh, interactions and responses uh, related to performance of a specific ecosystem. It's also important to appreciate the availability of long duration rainfall records. Um, here you see an assessment of Odisha made by AWER. Uh, it shows the rainfall deviation from the long term normal, where you see that the scale of the shown maps is rather regional and is actually more indicative for future expectations on performance where actually NDVI produces local results where it is more an indication of already achieved performance. So weather is more related to predictions, rainfall is more related to predictions, where NDVI is more related to assessments, what is basically now our interest for this present study. NDVI is commonly used globally to assess performance of agroecosystems at pixel level. However, NDVI is also great to create strata of cluster pixels that all show the same long-term behavior. We can then easily monitor differences between strata across seasons. See the graph at the bottom. Yeah, from year to year, we see differences related to the whole strata, uh, its behavior. Uh, but we can also monitor differences of strata within that strata. I will show you that later at uh, later of this PowerPoint. So the first step is to prepare the benchmark map, basically preparing the static static strata, uh, where we have to assume that each strata relates to a specific cropping system and cropping intensity. And that the full set of the when, where, what combination can be captured in the benchmark map, plus its legend. That's the reference map. We must assume that such a benchmark map has a 10 year validity, matching basically a common census cycle. So if we have this 3D NDVI data cube through ISO data, we can implode the 3D, which you see here on the right side, movie into a 2D map where time has basically moved to the legend and is represented here as NDVI profiles. We created way too many strata, 100 NDVI profiles, so that we visually, with expert knowledge, could further cluster, group them into less strata. 
That clustering delivered finally 22 legend entries. Shown here are three of these legend entries plus the original uh, NDVI profiles that were grouped together. We labeled these 22 groups as crop production system zones. It is an intermediate earth observation based legend and consists of one kilometer pixels. Each pixel is assumed to be a mixel of several land cover and land use types. All pixels of a crop production system zone are assumed to have a rather similar mix of similar land cover and similar land uses. To reduce the mixel amount of the map, we opted to upscale the one kilometer map to a 30 meter resolution map. For Odisha, even 30 meter pixels poorly captures individual fields. They are just very, very small and there are just very, very many. Anyhow, to create the resolution gain, we first needed to identify which periods within a year are essential to differentiate the 22 crop production system zones. Four critical periods were identified that you see here in green, pink, yellow, blue. These are the four periods. Using these and Google Earth Engine, we could create by period NDVI images containing medium NDVI values by pixel using all available TM8 imagery of the past five years. The four period specific NDVI images were stacked and after that we extracted again using ISO data 22 clusters from those layers. The legend entries of this 30 meter map were labeled as land use land cover classes. That is this map at the 30 meter level resolution. Still, this is an intermediate legend of NDVI profiles that now needs to be translated into factual facts from what is there and when it is, when is what there. Having the intermediate legend, the classes must basically be compared to the real life info as available with the Odisha ministries and institutions. To create a non-earth observation specific legend using terminology, etc., as in use by the Ministry of Agriculture. Defining that what or solving that what question required two specific data sets. One, area statistics by block, and two, expert knowledge of practiced crop calendars. The first data set could be obtained from the Directorate of Economics and Statistics in Odisha. I provide the link here in the top left. We had some problems recreating the ex exact block shape file. Blocks and tessils are not fully identical, but as is, we managed to get a table and the shape file and match that to the land use land cover map and could re redistribute, we could redistribute the area statistics as published by block, uh, redistributed to our ecological map. We did that through regression of specifically the autumn irrigated or the autumn rain fed or the winter irrigated, etc., or the winter rain fed data sets. So for each one individually, we have a solution where, in which ecological unit, what how much of it can be found. We compared it also then the findings with the 22 NDVI profiles, but also to a published crop calendar map as we could find in an IRI uh, publication. And here you see in the bottom, you see the summary of the crop calendars that were gathered from Odisha. And we see actually that if the ministry refers to autumn irrigated. It refers to the harvesting period, the September period when rice is harvested. Winter actually refers to a crop calendar that uh, covers rice that is longer on the field, with harvesting in October, November, even December. And the summer crops relate to a crop planted in January and harvested in May and June. 
So basically, moving from the 100 classes cluster map to the 22 classes crop production system zone map and the 22 classes 30 meter land use land cover map, now we also have a legend that reports fractions by area. For instance, here there's 91% of this area cropped during winter to irrigated rice. And then you have to look at the unit number 15. So this is the final legend that applies to the to this map. What is now left is a second objective, and that is the how much question, which needs to be addressed on a season by season basis. So here we have the reference, the benchmark map. Now we are going to do an assessment on a season by season basis for a specific land use land cover type rice cropping system and specific season. Now we reverse our attention back to the original 100 clusters, one kilometer map, where each long duration data set of each cluster produces the performance thresholds as required to assess season and pixel specific NDVI data. Because the performance is again fully an earth observation based exercise. The 30 meter map will now only function as a mask so that performance is only shown for areas of a specific land use land cover class. Before creating the DAFs, the dynamic area frames, do note that we assess present day pixel specific NDVA data on the basis of the past 20 years performance of all the pixels of a specific cluster. In fact, we do assess relative performance on the basis of past performance. Here is the mechanism how to do that. We have a specific cluster. Here we have cluster number 45, from which using all pixels by decade, these are the decades, we could have the 10, 50, and 90 percentile uh, values. The lines are shown here. This is the 90%. The red one is the 10%. And the median 50% is the blue line. From the blue line, we could assess when is the growing season. This is not the rice cropping season. This is the growing season in the area. And that is when the lack of the median, the ninth lack, basically crosses each line. So it is the period from this point to this point. Here it is marked in gray. So during this period, we do assess performance where the current NDVI values of new NDVI imagery are compared every decade to the ranges as shown in this graph. And where the 90% threshold will match 100% performance and the 10% threshold will match 0% performance. Then we average all the performances over all the decades of that growing season and we get our seasonal map. Here we see some examples of specific DAFs for, for instance, for the winter irrigated rice ecosystem. We indeed see season to season differences, but also noteworthy is that within land use land cover units, we see clear differences. For instance, here we see some poor performance pixels, we see a lot of average performance and we see in green very good performance and we see in another year that there are relatively more poor performance. Now if you have the CCE crop cuttings, we have on the X axis the values from this DAF and on the Y uh, axis we have the values of the estimate uh, the measured yields in the field and we expect a very clear correspondence of these two data sets. So we can, with that correspondence, we can translate this DAF into an actual crop yield estimation map and from that the crop production map. This shows a little bit more the dynamic or the dynamic aspects for a specific DAF in a specific cropping system. On the left side, irrigated systems and on the right side, rain fed systems. This is a animation for growing seasons covering 20 years and you see very clearly that from year to year randomly variability differs. This has nothing to do with the uh, that the unit has an internal variability. It has to do with that weather impacts differently 
uh, some rainfall locally in the north, some another year, some rainfall locally on the south, etc. This is really random seasonal influences by weather on crop performance. And these crop performance DAFs will be used now to extrapolate measurements from the field. I have a few slides to summarize the above, but I think my time my time is up, so I gave the floor back to the chairman. That's the case. If I stop sharing, uh, I think uh, yeah. Jabu, you can you can take it from uh, take it from here. Ah, okay, good. Oh, sorry, my video. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Keith, uh, for the very rich presentation. Again, for the audience, the report will have even more detailed explanation of step by step process we went through and what kind of data were used. And again, the idea is to capture the dynamic nature of the field variability um, caused by weather variability because thinner climate is always different. Uh, they require a different set of uh, sampling frame dynamically. Um, and yeah, this will be uh, kind of really nice segue to the next work stream that Srikant and Yogesh will be presenting. Once you know, uh, uh, once you have ideas on where to capture more samples uh, so that you can explain the variability better, uh, then how you do that with a very short period of time uh, with um, yeah, limited budget and, and the logically challenging situation. And, and also remind you that we did everything under COVID. Uh, so uh, we did have even bigger plan, but uh, we had to COVID uh, kind of settle with small pilots. But yeah, but the idea is there uh, to link those two work streams. Okay, great. And then I will hand it over to Srikan. Thank you, Jabu. Um, can you wish please uh, share the screen? Yeah, hope all of you can see the screen. Um, this is about the second work package. Uh, there, there is something called crop cutting experiment that is being done in the fields to make estimates at the field level. And it is a huge exercise during the seasons within India and outside India. So in experimental plots we can do in research stations. However, in farmers fields, the Department of Agriculture or the local agriculture bodies in countries will employ people to do something called crop cutting experiments on field plots of size, say three square meters or five square meters. Uh, in a hectare. So it is done diligently by people, but it's very expensive. This crop cutting experiments need to be done scientifically because the small area is then the weights and the yields are then extrapolated to the entire field area. And you can imagine because of human intervention, there can be and there are possibilities of actually having uh, crop cutting data that has been manipulated. Hence, anything you build over these manipulated data have been catastrophic in, in terms of uh, actually estimating yields on a larger scale, like even states or countries. So we have seen that this has become a major bottleneck, especially for the field of uh, crop insurance uh, companies, or there is a government-led uh, insurance uh, that schemes that are implemented, but the payouts have become extremely, extremely challenging. In fact, this is one of the challenges that worldwide uh, the crop um, crop policies having and crops uh, insurance companies do fail fail to actually deliver and especially the developing world um, these things have become a challenge in India uh, some of the payouts take at least one to two years and in fact there is a lot of pressure from the government to the on the private companies to deliver on it because sometimes the premiums, paid or collected through the government scheme and paid by the government and a portion paid by the farmers actually exceeds the payouts in disasters or uh, or times when they have to pay to the uh, to the farmer in case of a flood or a pest and disease because some of them are actually a percentage of the loss that the farmer has faith, uh, faced in their uh, fields. So this uh, whole uh, uh, crop at cutting experiments and the way they have done uh, actually has been problematic and many institutions around the world and in fact government agencies are uh, calling up uh, hackathons 
looking out for opportunities where they get uh, answers from the newly developed technologies and uh, including uh, satellite imagery, some from ground truth, can we use as an alternative? So this whole uh, project evolved with the idea of trying out, can we use a simple uh, camera phone, smartphone camera to get images of the yields of the crops? And can we do that actually? Is it enough? So that's where uh, this exploratory pilot started uh, with using uh, photogrammetry. So we are here talking about using a simple smartphone camera and then getting the 2D images or even a small 10 second video. And then can we actually predict the yields based on the volumetric model of recreating and transforming a 2D imagery to 3D. So this is how this idea, we have taken it forward through this pilot in this uh, work package. And uh, uh, I can assuredly tell you, this was really challenging in the pandemic time. And just as Jahu said, uh, we had to do some crop cutting experiments to actually then look at how the algorithm developed performs. So this is a proof of concept that we, uh, was well received. And uh, I would like to go further into the next slide. We either collect 10 to 12 images that are sourced around the fruiting body, which is for sorghum. This we tried it for sorghum and finger millet that we call ragi. But uh, as we went for from season to season, we realized it was not enough to get uh, uh, 2D images just like that, which would match 70 or 80 percent between the images when we go around 360 degrees around the fruiting body. That is the panicle. So we then. Uh, took another step to look at how a video would function and fairly well we could get a good uh, transformation and a 3D transformation from these uh, video clips. So first was extracting the features and then matching those features and we had a mapper for getting the 3D point cloud data and the volumetric analysis was the most challenging thing within this whole uh, uh, process that we, we sought and followed. Uh, because we had to do uh, away with the, the LIDAR or LEZ scan that was present in ICRISAT premises. It, it, we, we lost it in a freak accident. So we were not able to do that part using a LIDAR, but we actually did the ground truth data by actually in the physiology lab. So the, the physiologist helped us to get the volumes of the actual panicle. So that we used with a regression function then to arrive at a mathematical model that helped us to actually predict the yields. So this is how uh, we followed as a process and we had 270 uh, data points that we captured from both the sorghum and the ragi millet. So these were, these were at two locations. One is either the, the, in the bottom, you can see the dots in Hyderabad uh, where Ikrisat is located. And also we collected from uh, Odisha from a district. So uh, this was finger millet first, then from we went away from finger millet towards sorghum uh, that we collected uh, with an Ikrisat campus. Yes, this is the most important aspect of converting 2D to 3D. Uh, the structure from motion methodology was used and uh, we will go into more details after we show you a video clip, but the whole work was surrounding in around getting images and transforming them and extracting the 3D point cloud generation from these two. So this process included uh, the air structure from motion that was already present and uh, most of the people are, do use it uh, in the other fields, but we applied it for the first time into this ag, ag, ag uh, sector. Uh, at least uh, our team participated for the first time to use this methodology where we also had to estimate the volumes using convex cell modeling. And while uh, we could do the ground truth data uh, through panicle weights, doing individually uh, the volumes, calculating the volumes by Archimedes principle, but we had to use further modeling work using convex cell. So next, I would like to show you a slide where we want to actually show you how this application works. So we'll play, uh, we will just show you through a video. Then we will go for a... In the first input field, 
the user can enter the area of crop in hectares. If the value is not specified, by default, the area is set to 1 hectare. In the second input field, the user is asked to enter the number of panicles per square meter. If the value is not specified, by default, the plant density is set to 7 plants per square meter. Marker size is the length of the marker that is placed on the panicle. If the value is not specified, by default, the size of marker is set to 5.6 cm. In the last input field, the user can select the input as a video file or as a set of 12 images of the panicle. This is the input video of the sorghum panicle captured using a smartphone. Click on Browse and select the input video or the images. Click on Start to initiate the reconstruction. Wait for the conversion to finish. Click on Clean to clear the noise. The user can rotate the panicle using the left mouse button. Zoom in or zoom out using the scroll wheel. Repeat the clean step until all the noise is eliminated. Zoom in to the marker and increase the point size. The point size can be increased or decreased using the slider provided in the scene section. Click on the selection tab and select two corner points of the marker using Ctrl plus left mouse button. Click on measure to get the yield. So the learnings that we had from this whole pilot work was Basically, the point cloud from us um, that was developed using smartphone video clip is much denser and clearer than the images that were individually sourced, like the 2D images 10 to 12. And uh, um, uh, there is one, one more thing, like we need to take a lot of care when we take these videos or the images, even with slight wind. In fact, we found it is difficult to get clear images, especially the 2D ones. Then because photogrammetry has this issue of uh, scale, uh, we had to use a marker. So here we have used a keychain, but the user can use anything that is available locally at their place, but they need to know the length of the marker. So, so that that is the one dimension that photogrammetry then can use it to then quantify this big based on the distances of the camera that is from the object. So that, that is the reason a marker has to be used. We find also that uh, while using it, the users may find difficulty in selecting the corners because we've been used to uh, dragging these uh, three point clouds and uh, getting to the sizes and looking at the uh, image, 3D point cloud image, it is easy for us, but for the initial users, they, they will have slight difficulties in using this technology initially. So the processing time also is more than two to three minutes. So at the moment, because we need a, a we have a computer laptop with a very high end uh, uh, capacity and the GPU is also high. So uh, that, that is the challenge actually, if we are going to place this uh, in a cloud and uh, get a uh, application, which is the future that we will be planning. But uh, these are some of these uh, uh, things that we have come to know only based on using this because reconstructing it and using that whole processing time really takes a lot of time. Initially, the first time it took almost 10 to 15 minutes. We had to change the back end to actually get it to two to three minutes. Then uh, one uh, missing element we still have is the validation that has not yet happened using a LIDAR uh, or because of the lazy scan uh, that we missed. So uh, ultimately this uh, whole POC actually we have the now look if we look at into it, we know that there is potential and it can be used. And we also know that we need to validate it in the field. So this is one thing that needs to be done. And uh, uh, is, I'll come to the futuristic uh, uh, things that we have planned. 
uh, further to do on this. Uh, the noise that you saw, uh, I think for the user to always press the button clean and all, that can also be automated. And the next version, we will try to automate the whole noise reduction uh, in, the, in, the, in the 3D reconstruction image. And then uh, the markers that, that, are, that we use, um, in fact, uh, it can be very challenging in, in a field situation. So we are also uh, trying to see if that can be actually automated. No human, we don't want human intervention because that is the place where, because uh, even if you say change a millimeter uh, of the size, it is giving a very high deviation and variation. So we feel okay, we will want to actually automate that process too. And then uh, the, in the whole exercise, uh, we also have to give an input called density per square meter. Uh, mind you, um, when you change it from seven to eight, the average uh, uh, panicles per square meter, and you make it into a 10,000 square meters, and it, it's, it, it's a huge difference. So selecting the plot, sample place where they do, because um, uh, from insurance, uh, uh, it's like the stakeholders can have their views and they can use it as they want. For a farmer, he wants to have show that his crop is less yielding or something. He can select a plot and the place where they can actually select an average size of panicle, which is very small. So they can repeat this whole process and use it and make five or 10 places and then average it in the future. If there, that's the possibility that we can see, and there are solutions for these challenges, but we feel uh, that the state, we need to also prepare a very, uh, and demystify this technology to the extent that uh, human intervention is completely removed. So we would uh, look forward for working in that direction. And also, uh, probably because we are using it for cereals uh, at the moment, it will be probably easier also for fruits and vegetables because they are solid. And uh, uh, the estimates that come, because even with the slight wind and the movement of the panicle uh, at the top of the crop uh, can actually, uh, the error is there. There is a slight error. But that can, the, the, this technology can actually work very well on fruits and vegetables. And we would also like to work on uh, other crops. Now uh, you will see a, uh, actually a demo of it. Please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, Yogesh, we don't see your screen yet. Uh, can you see my screen also? Uh, yes, yes, we can yeah. see now. Okay. So uh, this uh, this is a web application that we have that we have developed. So uh, like you like you see, there are only three input, like four inputs. One is the area and hectares. Uh, that is the density of the density of the crop. That is here we have given it as seven panicles per square meter, and the uh, size of the marker. So uh, since we don't have much time, I'm directly, uh, I've, I've, I've converted a video into a 3D model and directly selecting the 3D model as input. So, yeah. So uh, this is a converted 3D model that you can see. As you can see, the, uh, the initial 3D model will have a lot of noise because, uh, because there are many background uh, there, there is so much background data that has been collected by the camera. So uh, this is the cleaning step that we are trying to automate. So uh, as of now in our application, the user has to uh, clean this. Like uh, I have provided a button to clean the data, but again, uh, we would like to automate this step as well. Now, I, I guess you can see the panicle now with, with the keychain, And uh, we can further clean it because we want the convex hull to be built around the panicle and not uh, and not around all the data. So I'm further cleaning the data and you can see almost all the noise getting eliminated. So uh, this is a clean panicle and uh, I have we have a provision to increase or decrease the point size here. I'm increasing the point size to better select the points. Uh, I hope uh, it is visible. Yeah, so now, uh, now the next step is uh, since uh, scale is the inherited inherited problem in the photogrammetry technique, 
we have the we have placed a marker of known dimensions now what uh, to compute the real world dimensions of the panicle uh, we would like the user to select two points on the pan uh, on the marker because we already know the size of marker we will be using this to estimate the true size of the panicle okay once the once two points are selected the user have to click on measure and you can get the yield in tons so this is another thing that we want to automate that is uh, we want to identify the marker in the generated 3d model and extract the dimensions of the marker uh, this will further reduce the human intervention yeah so uh, this is all we have done till date and for the future for the future upgrades uh, uh, we would also like to try out with different fruits because uh, like Sri, uh, like dr srikant already said there will be no wind effects on solid objects and we can also estimate uh, the volume of solid objects more perfectly than that of this uh, panicles like sorghum and finger mill that is all from my answer thank you thank you yogesh Thanks very much. Um, um, Jawu uh, asked me to 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 step in here for the next part uh, for the for the questions and answers, and then at the end of this Q and A session, um, I think I'll hand over to Kai for a, a few final words. But I just wanted to say, um, well, first of all, thanks both uh, uh, Case and uh, Shrikanth and Yogesh for the presentation. I mean, the whole aim of this let's say blue skies bit of research was to to address to to these two issues about can we be more um, scientific in how we sample and where we sample? So the first part of the, the presentation from Case was working on where to sample. It's really how do we use Earth observation data from coarse and medium resolution satellites to better understand the spatial and temporal variability and use that to have these dynamic area sampling frames so that when you go into the field, you know that your sampling for yield is representative. You're capturing the variability. The second part that Srikant and Yogesh presented is all about, okay, can we improve the way that we do sampling? Can we move away from crop cuts and find more non-destructive methods um, using, again, remote sensing, but at a much finer resolution, using it in a smartphone, and really pushing the boundaries here in what is possible. Uh, in our group, we've been sharing a few recent publications that have come out. Uh, and bear in mind, we started this work, I think, in late 2019, just before COVID struck. Um, and we're now seeing some publications coming out where people are starting to do this kind of work with fruit, with apples, um, oranges, or larger um, vegetables like pumpkins. What we've tried here is a completely different scale, looking at finger millet, which is about the, one of the smallest grains you could possibly imagine. So the challenge here of doing this in the field is quite something. So it's nice to see this exploration come, um, you know, show some real promise in how, you know, as smartphone and Haldale devices become, um, faster processing and better quality um, cameras, you know, how we can really see the potential for this in future, but recognizing some of the challenges that are still still there to be addressed. So I think it's really a, a pleasure to see these two things come together, but recognizing that this really was a, a challenging project with the additional challenge of working under, under COVID. So I see there are a couple of written questions which have come in. Um, uh, Kai, you're, you're now the host, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue to, uh, to just mon moderate this Q&A session. And maybe if we go through them from the top to the bottom, um, I see there's a few questions from, from Berber Kramer and Neil um, Hausmann. And maybe we start with the questions to, to Case for the first presentation, and then I'll hand over to Srikanth um, and you're going to take the, the second set of questions. So I hope you can both see the questions in the Q&A. So maybe we start with, um, with Berber's question on the first presentation. So it's how did you attribute the variation in the dynamic area frames to random variation in rainfall instead of, for instance, variation in crop management? Well, it is a very correct question, but the question is, I have to return, is it needed at this level? We know there is variability spatially across an area in yields. Do we really have to know what causes the variability in yield? Because as I sh have shown in one slide, there are so many factors that play together to have an impact on the output of the system. And what we measure is the output of the system and not all the various components 
that influence the system. So we have an integrated indicator called NDVI, measuring the output of the system. And it does that extremely well. And the scale of the interaction of all these individual factors on the output of the system is very uh, detailed. Well, if you go for rainfall input to the system, that is very, uh, how do you call it, medium, uh, regional scaled, uh, of a different resolution, and also further away of really having impact onto the system. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So it's it, it's a good point. Uh, I, I appreciate the question because you do want to understand what's driving the variability. But the purpose here was to actually represent, capture the variability, so that you can sample it, not to understand the causes of the variability. But of course, this work could lead to that type of further analysis, where you want to really understand what are the factors causing yield variation in different places over space and time. Um, so thanks for that question. I'd like to go to Neil's question because it's on the same topic case, which okay. is the first one on how transferable is the EO sampling frame to other regions or crops? Okay, and even it says, can you do it for Nigeria? Um, I would actually say no problem at all because most of the hard work is fully statistical earth observation based. It follows a very uh, yeah, unique a flowchart of, uh, of, of processing steps. The only thing missing in that whole flowchart is that you have to label your land cover, uh, land use units with what is there in reality. If nothing is available, then you have to just go to the field and uh, sample according to mapped units. And that can be done relatively fast because the map guides you where to sample in a very easy way. To quantify cropped areas, of course, you need uh, Ministry of Agriculture to, to pull in a lot of uh, hard work that you cannot do. But uh, making the DAFs, I can make for Nigeria without specifying to which systems it applies. So to that level, yes, it can be transferred anywhere at any time. Thanks, Case. Um, so I hope, um, Barbara and Neil, that that's... Um um, answered your initial questions and that if you have further follow-up we'll be happy to to take them here as well but now I'd like to to hand over to to Srikanth and the team there in Ikrasat for the other set of questions which relate to the uh, the smart firm based yield um, estimation. Yeah so I can see Neil's question on uh, uh, how come I can see Kaushal Guard asking how many plants or area should be scanned for converting biomass value on per hectare basis. Did any validation uh, was made on this? So, um, how many plants or area? See, density of uh, the, the plants per unit area is, uh, is going to significantly. Uh, change the and alter the yield uh, values that are predicted here. So uh, yes, this validation in the field has to take place in the coming season. So this is a POC that we have just developed at the end of the second season that we had, and we had very limited time to even get this POC done. So um, this is this is the most important thing: the value that we enter, how many plants per square meter. It can really that that is where. Uh, again, human intervention does is needed. And while we do crop cutting experiments, selecting the ideal place to do the crop cutting experiment is also should be scientifically done, but that is the place where error can still happen. So uh, coming to Mr. Tiwari, when the 3D will be used for fruits and vegetable in that case, how the yield only factor can serve to determine the losses to the farmers as in case of F and V, there is also a lot of variations in price. Oh yeah, you are now connecting the uh, uh, losses that the farmer can face with, with these estimates and then linking it to uh, F and V where there's so much of price variation within the at the end of the season. Usually, there's a price uh, price drops because of the glut. We do understand that, but uh, there are some um, 
MSPs for some most of the major crops at least. So that's where I am talking in context of India. Uh, if you are asking uh, that price, we definitely agree. After the price fluctuation is really really high. The season and off season prices do vary, but uh, when it comes to uh, decision on any uh, estimate on the uh, on converting this yield to a, uh, an insurer, I think uh, they go back to the price uh, that has been declared uh, in the government portals on uh, these uh, crops uh, for which they're asking. Yeah. But fruits and veggies, unfortunately, uh, we do not have a system of maintaining them and there is a lot of variation. Thank you. I think Srikant, there are, there are a couple of other questions posed to you as well. There was one from Berber Kremer at the beginning of the, at the top of the list. And I see a few more coming in. There's quite a lot of interest in this uh, this high tech approach. It's good to see. To what extent are delays in payouts driven by delays in government paying their share of the subsidies versus delays in processing of disputes around crop cutting experiment data? Uh, Berber, thank you for this. Um, I know you are working in India too, and with the insurance company, um, I can acknowledge and say. It, it takes ages. Uh, last year, Karif season uh, crop loss. I think it will happen in this year somewhere if there's if it is if they are fortunate that that district because the district administration, uh, the the agriculture department holds the key on the pressure they exert on the companies and uh, also uh, the actuarials do not have as of now. Uh, concrete evidence. So the insurance companies are looking for alternatives to actually, can we use an evidence, a number, even if it is 10% variation from the actual, it is still a good number. So in I, I can only say um, the governments um, and dealing with governments have been uh, uh, a challenge uh, for the insurance companies, especially if the government uh, subsidizes uh, those uh, policies. And most of it is run by a subsidy, especially the agriculture department. Most of the major crop subsidy on insurance is there. So I, I, I know I may not have completely answered her, but we have to live with the reality here. So am I missing something here? After No MSP on fruits and vegetables. Exactly, sir. Actually, I said major crops, but for fruits and vegetables, it is totally dynamic. Mr. Tiwari, you're right. Geezer. Yeah, does the marker size 5.6 centimeter determine the precision of the measurement? No, no, sir. Um, th that is what we want to automate later. But yes, if, if it is 5.65 centimeters, the whole dimensions do change. So uh, the size of the marker, if somebody uses a two centimeter um, eraser or something, they hang, um, they have to be, it has to be very clearly known. Uh, this is something if we do this uh, transformation from 2D to 3D um, because of the distance the object is from the uh, camera. So that can vary from users. So in order to cut down those differences, we need to have it. And uh, the size of the marker is clearly a very important uh, aspect here. Minimum camera parameters required for real measurements. We want to do with the phone with the least configuration and just a very simple phone. So we're not looking at uh, high-end phones at all uh, while doing this uh, experiment. I wonder if the captured image takes into account each stock of rice as the demonstration was done on a single stock. If so, is it possible to distinguish efficiently between the stocks for calculation of the overall production? Yes, we just like a sample is taken for estimating a soil health, uh, and a crop cutting experiment of a sample space and trying to predict for the entire area, there is going to be um, a variation that, that we have to live with at, at the present. So uh, we, the, you, you're right, uh, not all panicles are, uh, of our, you are given rice as an example. Yes, the tiller, uh, the, some have big and small. So we average it out by doing multiple of times, like you can do it for five times or 10 times per acre because it doesn't cost and it takes very less time. It takes two to three hours to do a crop. So, so 
for glory that is what i can say at the moment thanks thanks Rikan, for taking taking those questions i'm i'm also conscious of the time we're coming up to the last 5 minutes of the scheduled um, webinar and i believe this is the time to hand over to, to to kai to to wrap up and say a few final words um thanks a lot for all the questions and the interest in this and again uh, thanks to the team here uh, led by case and to Srikant there working under pretty challenging conditions in these last two years to make the progress they've done on what was a really uh, you know, innovative way to combine remote sensing from two completely different scales to address this challenge of where to sample and how to sample efficiently. Much more to be done here in this rich area of work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me take over then. I think there's one more question from our friend and colleague Alabi from IATA, um, where crops are taller than the men, how do you take video or photos? Thinking about coconuts, maybe in extreme cases, but. Well, uh, we have selfie sticks, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought too, but let's hear from the experts. You, you need a ladder if you want to do on some of these things. So yes. Um, and we also say that uh, when at the time of harvest, you have to harvest the crop. So you will do a crop cutting. So you can cut it and do it. In fact, so we have to dry the sample. And also we do a lot of work after that too, to get to this algorithm to then estimate and connect the yields and weights. So at the point of uh, harvest time, I think it's okay to, you're going to harvest it. So this is done at the time of harvest. So I find... Uh, some pickers, if it's a fruit or something that is at the above, that that's that's going to be there. Good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the audience for listening to this very fascinating topic. I find myself also um, when you look at some of the high-end tablets and uh, uh, smartphones with lidar. I've been wanting to try that out for quite a while. Let's say to look at height of, of maize and other crops, you know, but it's sometimes a bit tricky to buy one of those from project funds because people frown on you. But we I think there's buy a lot of... iPad actually with the LiDAR and yeah. to our surprise, uh, these panicles, it is not able to actually do the 3D mesh actually because you need oh. a solid object of a bigger size. Unfortunately, the panicle size is too small in the environment. We tried so many apps that were there in Apple, iOS and <laughs> unable to get the slider. So Good to know. The challenge is there. So that is interesting too. And maybe I don't have to invest in the near future then. Um, we've seen a lot of movement in this area. I think there's a lot of interest. Um, I've seen some of the bigger companies work with, let's say robots with different cameras. So I think if we combine this in the future, let's say smartphone from different angles, plus UAV as Alabi was mentioning too, and you can get some very interesting, I've seen some examples from fruits where you can drive through the rows and then AI does the counting. It works for strawberries also and, and maize. Yeah? So there's quite a lot of development going on. So I think we will see some fascinating solutions that probably will save us some time, get us more precision in the future. Um, if you look at crop cuts, yeah, it was mentioned, it's a lot of work in the field, not always pleasant. Um, tricky has to be representative. Our colleague Jordan Chamberlain just published a paper on that, which methods for crop cuts are the best, but if we move more and more into technology, which is getting cheaper and more available to, to larger amounts of people, I think there's a lot of potential for this. So many thanks to Andy, Case, Shrikant and Yogesh for sharing your work with us and I hope to see you all in the next uh, seminar of the series. That's welcome. Goodbye. Thank, for Thank you. Nice to talk about it. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks to the audience. Thank you. Bye.